Welcome to chapter 17. In this chapter, we will be discussing earnings per share. Our first learning objective is to understand why earnings per share, often abbreviated as EPS, is an important number and how it should be presented, disclosed, and analyzed. Common shareholders have a residual interest in a company. The return on their investment is based on how well the company is doing. EPS provides insight to shareholders about how much of a company's available income can be attributed to the shares that they own, assessing future dividend payouts, and assessing the value of each share. EPS disclosures help by indicating the amount of income earned by each share. EPS calculations are done for both basic and diluted earnings per share. Basic EPS is the actual earnings over the actual number of common shares outstanding. And we do prorate this for the time that the shares were outstanding during the period. And diluted EPS is a what if calculation. This considers possible negative impacts on common shares from convertible debt or options, which could be exercised to result in more common shares. So really important, our formula for figuring out the EPS or earnings per share is the income available to common shareholders divided by the weighted average number of common shares. And this formula we will be using throughout the entire chapter. Under IFRS, EPS information must be reported, usually after net income on the income statement. Earnings per share should be disclosed separately for continuing operations, discontinued operations, and net income. This provides the impact of continuing operations because it excludes gains or losses from operations not continuing in the future. That's why we show the income from continuing up your EPS per continuing operations separately from discontinued operations. When both types of operations exist, show both basic and diluted earnings per share for both types. Discontinued operations, EPS can be reported in the notes to the financial statement. The following shows a typical presentation of basic and diluted earnings per share on the face of the income statement when both continuing and discontinued operations are included. So you can see here we've got a section called basic earnings per share. We've got the earnings per share for income before discontinued operations. We've got the earnings per share for income for discontinued operations income or loss in this case. We've got the earnings per share for net income. And then we've also got below that a section for diluted earnings per share, which shows the same amounts, income before continued operations and discontinued operations and net income. IFRS disclosure requirements include earnings per share for all periods presented with a stock split or dividend per share amounts from prior periods must be restated for consistency if diluted EPS is reported for one period, it should be reported for all periods, even if it's the same as the basic EPS. When results of operations for prior periods are restated, EPS data should also be restated along with the restatements effect. ASPE does not require EPS calculations or disclosures. ASPE is not used for public companies. So everything in chapter 17 is based on IFRS. ASPE doesn't have any guidance for EPS calculations because it's primarily for private companies. So analysis, EPS is one of the most highly visible standards for assessing management's performance, predicting a company's future, and IFRS is very specific about its calculation, and it's important to analyze the potential dilutive impact of securities. There's also a price earnings ratio, which relates earnings to the price the shares are trading. It's a quick estimate of the value of the shares and it's an easy comparison with other companies. Okay, learning objective number two, calculate basic earnings per share. So we've talked about the theory in learning objective one, and now we're gonna get into the calculations in learning objective two. 
So there's two types of capital structures that a company can have. There's a simple capital structure, which is only common shares are non-convertible securities. And we only need to calculate and present basic EPS if there's no convertible securities. Complex structures are where there's common shares and securities that have a dilutive effect on earnings per common share. So debt and equity instruments, preferred shares, warrants, options, and contingently issuable shares. So debt and equity instruments, if they're converted, they could result in an increase in our common shares. Same thing with warrants and options and contingently issuable shares. So because all of these securities potentially have an impact on our common share outstanding number, potentially an impact on our net income as well, which we'll see, then these we need to take into account what would happen if all these securities were exercised. And that's what diluted earnings per share is. If there's a complex capital structure where some of these hybrid financial instruments exist, then we need to calculate and present both basic and diluted earnings per share. Basic earnings per share is potential common or ordinary share. It gives the holder the right to obtain a common share. And contingently issuable shares are issuable for little or no consideration once a certain condition has been resolved. So if that means once income reaches a certain threshold, as soon as that happens, then some party will receive uh, in the issuance of a share, then those are contingently issuable shares. The calculation of earnings per share for a simple capital structure involves two amounts. The income available to common shareholders divided by the weighted average number of common shares. So we need to know how we're going to calculate both of those two items. Income available to common shareholders. This is net income less amounts set aside to cover other obligations, such as preferred dividends that rank in preference over common shares. If preferred shares are cumulative and the dividend is not declared in the current year, we do subtract it from current net income or add it to the loss um, to take into a Fact, uh, to take into account the fact that we do owe that amount to the preferred shareholders before we can make any distribution to the common shareholders. Dividends in arrears would have been included in prior year's calculation. So even if the preferred dividends, cumulative preferred dividends haven't been issued for a number of years, we would only need to take into account the current year and not worry about the prior years as those would have been taken into account in the prior year EPS calculations. Let's take a look at an example. Income available to common shareholders. So this is the, uh, this is the numerator in our calculation of EPS, which is income available to common shareholders divided by the weighted average number of common shares outstanding. So right now we're talking about the top of the, the calculation what is the income available to common shareholders? We just said we need to make sure that if there's cumulative preferred shares, we subtract any dividend that hasn't been paid in the year because that has to be paid out before the common shareholders can receive a distribution, regardless of whether it's been declared or not. And here's an example. So company A, this company has net income of 3 million. There's 100,000 class A, $4 cumulative shares, and there's 100,000 class B, $3 non-cumulative shares. Both of those are presumably preferred shares and no dividend declarations or payments have been made during the year. So if we wanna know what the income is available to common shareholders, we know that the net income of the company is 3 million, which we're just told, but we know that there's one class of cumulative shares that we're only concerned with cumulative, non-cumulative doesn't matter. So cumulative shares are a hundred thousand, four dollars. So a hundred thousand times four dollars is what we owe out for this, is what we owe for this year. So 100,000 times $4 gives us 400,000. So we're gonna deduct that from the 3 million, meaning that the income available to common shareholders is 2.6 million. For the non-cumulative shares, it would, we would only need to deduct it if the dividend had been declared. Weighted average number of common shares. So we've talked about the numerator, now let's talk about the denominator, the weighted average number of common shares. All, P, all EPS calculations use the weighted average number of common shares as the denominator. 
Shares that are issued or purchased during the period must be weighted by the fraction of the period that they have been outstanding. Let's take a look at an example here. So here we see that Salomsky Inc. has the following information about changes in its common shares, outstanding common shares for the period. We can see we have the beginning balance, there were some issued, repurchased, issued, and then the ending balance. And we're asked to calculate the weighted average number of common shares outstanding. So this is what that looks like. So we look at the period that each shares have been outstanding. So we've got January 1st to April 1st is our first period or January 1st to March 31st, we had 90,000 outstanding. Oh, let's go here, so 90,000. Then on April 1st, we're gonna add 30,000. So now we're gonna have 120,000 outstanding from April 1st to the next period, which is June 30th. So you can see that we're, we've multiplied it by each of the periods. So January 1st to March 1st is a quarter, so three over 12. April 1st to June 30th is also a quarter, three over 12. Then we've got July 1st, we repurchased 39,000 shares. So now we only have 81,000 outstanding. And that's gonna continue until November 1st. So the day before the next issuance is October 31st. And that is four months out of 12 months. And then November 1st, we're gonna issue another 60,000, meaning that we now have 141,000 outstanding for November and December, and that's two out of 12 months. So once we multiply through all those fractions, it will give us the weighted average number of shares, which in this case is 103,000 shares. So WAX is weighted average common shares. So WAX, dividend splits and reverse stock splits. When di stock dividends or stock splits occur, the calculation of the weighted average number of shares also requires restatement of the shares outstanding before the stock split. A stock dividend or split does not change shareholders' total investment. It only increases the number of common shares. By restating earnings per share, valid comparisons can be made between periods. The shares outstanding before the stock dividend must also be restated. Before shares adjusted for the stock dividend, so these shares are stated on the same basis as the shares issued after the stock dividend. If the stock dividend or split occurs before, between the end of the year and when the financial statements are issued, the weighted average number of shares, EPS, and comparative amounts must be restated. So when we were looking at contingent liabilities, IFRS was really strict and said, listen, whatever happened at the end of the year is what, it, is what you have to lock into. Whereas for earnings per share, IFRS says, listen, if there's a stock split after the end of the, uh, end of the year, when you're still preparing your financials, everything needs to be restated. So it will make sense to the investors. So here's an example of a stock split. So in this situation, there was a stock split on June 1st. You can see there, it says a 50% stock dividend. So the 60,000 became, or the 180,000 was split. So, or we had 60,000, which then became 180,000. So we've restated the prior blue bars there have been restated to show the impact of the 50% stock split in calculating the weighted average number of shares. We'll take a look at another example, it's more clearer, right here. So assume that Bay Limited has the following information about changes in the number of common shares outstanding during the year. We're given a bunch of information here as well. And you can see that on June 1st, there is a 50% stock dividend. Calculate the weighted average number of shares. So June 1st, there's a stock split that we can see there where we get an extra 60,000 shares. And this is what it would look like in that situation. So the shares outstanding before the stock split, so June 1st is when the stock split occurred. So we don't need to do anything at June 1st because it's already restated for the stock split. What we need to do is look at any comparative periods that we show or, or the other periods that we show in our calculation. And that's the uh, January 1st to February 1st and March 1st to May 31st. We need to make sure we have a 50% stock split reflected. And the way that we're doing that here is we're showing a restatement in our calculation. These are simply working papers. These wouldn't be in the financials. 
but we're multiplying the shares outstanding by 1.5 to reflect the fact that we're getting an extra 50% stock. So running through those calculations would automatically adjust our entire calculation for the whole period of the weighted average number of shares outstanding for the stock split. And that would give us the new weighted average number of 180,000. There is a note here, there isn't anything in this example, but it's just worth noting that if you are looking at a table or look something like this, where you're looking at a continuity of share changes, here you can see that on December 31st, we're simply given the ending balance. Now, if you had an issuance on December 31st, you wouldn't take that into account in your calculations because it wouldn't have been outstanding during the year. It would have only been outstanding for one day. So therefore we would ignore it. Just a side note. Weighted average number of common shares, mandatorily convertible instruments. Financial instruments where common shares will be issued in the future due to mandatory conversion. We're gonna assume that conversion has already taken place and the weighted average number of common shares calculated will be calculated as though those instruments were already converted and the common shares were outstanding. If there's contingently issuable shares, which will, if they're not considered contingently issuable, if it will depend on the passage of time, but if it's dependent on something else, then we're gonna include it in EPS as soon as the conditions are satisfied. So basically if someone can convert a common share, we're gonna assume that if they could do it, they would do it. And that's the end of chapter 17, part one. Please join me for the tutorial section where we'll look at some calculations of basic earnings per share. Mm -hmm.